Previous to this, there had been a lot of persecution of Muslims uh, in Arabia. And now that Muhammad's uncle and wife are dead, he too faces persecution and catches wind of a assassination plot. And so he immigrates to the city of Yathrib, which is named Medina. This event is known as the Hijra, the immigration. This is the start of the Islamic calendar. So Muslims base their dates on when the Hijra took place. So it's the year, I think it's 1437, 1438, something like that, in the year of the Hijra. In Medina, however, the success that Muhammad had been looking for, the religious success, the political success, is finally realized. He is given essentially control of the city orchestrates a covenant of Medina that is an agreement of how people are going to live, not just the growing Muslim population, but the Jewish tribes of the area as well. A Muslim commonwealth is created. And the notion of unity under Islam replaces the notion of tribal unity. Now, Muhammad apparently thought that the Jews and Christians would follow him, they would be allied, allied with him because he is a prophet of God, which of course Christians and Jews are going to do not. Okay? But under Islam in Medina, the Jewish community especially does have uh, some religious freedoms. But eventually, it's the rejection of Muhammad's prophethood that leads to a change within Islam. Early on, prayers had been said towards Jerusalem. They were now to be said towards Mecca. There was also animosity towards the Jewish community. And the Jews were looked upon as enemies to any sort of consolidation. From the year 622 to the year 630, the cities of Mecca and Medina engage in a variety of battles. Concerns for Mecca of the growing Muslim force. When the Muslims won, they considered it as evidence of God's favor. When they lost, they blamed it on the Jews for revoking the covenant of Medina. By the year 630, however, Muhammad has gathered a sizable enough army that he believes he can take over Mecca. So he travels to Mecca. As the Meccans uh, see the size of the army that has come against them, according to the tradition, they surrender. They are given the opportunity to convert to Islam or to leave the city, and most of them, of course, convert. Any of those that converted are given amnesty from any sort of previous acts against the Muslim community and are to be protected. Muhammad, in the last couple of years of his life, gradually begins to unite the Arabian tribes, sometimes through diplomacy, sometimes through force. Now, essentially what we're talking about here is a, there is a growing political force now in the Middle East. Now, contrast that to Christianity's development. Now, by this time, right, 630s, Christianity is a sizable political force. But that's not how it started out. It had taken several hundred years before that it happened. And Christianity started out spreading among marginalized people, people without power, and only recently, historically speaking, uh, had become a political power. Islam, however, gets there much more quickly. And they spread often through political power. That, I don't mean to suggest that they uh, converted people through the sword, although that sometimes happened. But essentially it's spreading much, rapid, much more rapidly, and often people in areas controlled by either the Sassanids or the Byzantines often felt that Muslim rule was, was not really any different than what they'd been experiencing under the Byzantine rule. The Byzantine rulers sometimes oppress them. So the Muslims might actually be liberators to some of these people. And sometimes they were even allowed to continue 
to worship Christianity and have similar types of independence, often while paying a tax. Muhammad, however, died in the year 632. And it appears that Muhammad did not specifically choose a successor. Name who was going to be you know, uh, the leader after him. And so his close companions have to really try to keep this community together, which they're able to do. The elders of Medina uh, select Abu Bakr as the first caliph, successor to the messenger of God. The caliph was both a religious leader and a political or military leader. And it was felt by a lot of the Muslims that these leaders should be chosen by the community, a communal uh, decision, as opposed to later on, which we'll see as a dynasty. A minority of the group, however, does not support the um, selection of Abu Bakr. They actually want Ali, who is Muhammad's son-in-law and cousin, uh, to be his successor. So there's a, the beginnings of a, a split. And even when Ali does become the caliph, there is still some challenges. So Abu Bakr is the first caliph. Umar succeeds him. Uthman succeeds him. And then Ali. This reign of these four caliphs is known as the Orthodox Caliphate, sometimes referred to as the rightly guided caliphate, kind of believed to be this golden age of Islamic rule. And as they took control and as, they, uh, as history went on, uh, Islam expanded shortly after Muhammad's death into places like Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, and Iraq. Well, those are the modern names, but that gives you an idea of where we're talking about. Muslims took over Egypt from the Byzantines in 641 and began to move across North Africa. Conversions in these early decades did not appear to have been forced. In fact, it appears like that most of the Arabs who are spreading Islam are not interested in conversion. They believe that conversion, or that uh, Islam is an Arabic religion, which of course probably went against some of the things that Muhammad was preaching. But essentially, it's spreading into these regions for political control, not necessarily conversion. Later on, however, as Islam starts to spread and as diversity starts to happen within Islam, as more than just Arabs are present, Later, there would be an emphasis on conversion and sometimes even forced conversion. So we shouldn't think of Islamic conversion here as solely by the point of the sword and solely as part of the political process, political domination. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes people converted to Islam because they thought it more appealing than Christianity. Eventually, though, civil war breaks out during Ali's rule. He was opposed by a group that included um, Abu Bakr's wife, excuse me, Abu Bakr's daughter, who had also been Muhammad's wife. And so Abu Bakr had a daughter that married Muhammad, and they're kind of opposing Ali. And uh, there's another situation going on in Syria that's also causing some rebellion. Ali's trying to maintain this unity of Islam, but his compromises ultimately lead a group of his followers to think he has gone too far, and so they assassinate him. And so his own followers are responsible for his death. Out of this, the governor of Syria, a man named Muawiyah, is able to seize control. Moving the center of the caliphate from Arabia, which is where it was in the Orthodox period, to Syria, and the city of Damascus is kind of the capital city. Essentially, it is transitioned now from a caliphate chosen by the leaders of the community to a dynasty. And so while 
theoretically, the caliphate is still chosen by the community, the decision is already predetermined. Right? Who's going to be the next ruler? And this essentially, this kind of a thought, like, it's this that ISIS is trying to get back to. And it's that kind of power, why, why you hear ISIS talking about wanting to establish the caliphate. Right? Well, this is what they're trying to do, is trying to establish this Islamic rule that hasn't been in existence for a uh, hundred or so years, uh, closer to two hundred years. During the Umayyad Caliphate, well, the Orthodox Caliphate runs from 632 to about 661. The Umayyad Caliphate runs from about 661 to 750. We'll talk about that next group that starts in 750 in the next time period, that later Middle Ages. And so, in that period, less than 100 years, it moves from being centralized in Asia with a few places reaching out into the, the uh, Middle East, the Near East, uh, into Africa, expanding from that to the whole way to Spain, across Africa, Middle East, over to India, and even almost to China. And in fact, in the early 8th century, Muslims were beginning to expand from Spain into um, other regions in Eastern Europe when Charles Martel stops them at the Battle of Tours. Muslims, of course, continued to uh, spread into Africa over these centuries. And a lot of the conversion, though, is taking place not through politics or force, but is taking place through merchants traveling around, sharing news about Islam, people traveling, uh, religious clerics, right, these religious leaders going in and talking about Islam. And only later will it result in conquest kind of being the push for conversion. Still, in this latter part, it's an Arabic enterprise, but it's gradually diversified. Power in Spain is centered in the city of Cordoba, and the territories were known as Al-Andalus. So if you heard the term Andalusian, and it's related to uh, this control of Spain. The Mayas would eventually fall to another group known as the Abbasids, and so the Abbasid Caliphate is set up after the uh, Umayyad Caliphate. And many of the remaining individuals of the Umayyad Caliphate would flee to Spain, where they would have some protection uh, and some safety from the Abbasids. This map gives you an idea of the time periods we're talking about. And this darker orange section here being the region largely controlled by Muhammad and then gradually controlled by the uh, Orthodox Caliphate, spreading out of that. The, the uh, lighter orange is the Orthodox Caliphate, and then the lavender uh, is the area that has been added by the mines. Uh, this one, of course, getting to the Indus River, which would have been the boundary of what what we call India today. Which again is a rather sizable territory in a relatively short amount of time. After the stop of uh, the, uh, the Muslims in Battle of Tours, uh, where you see Tours right, taking place right there, uh, you see the French. Relationships between the Islamic Caliphate or the Islamic Empire and the West in general aren't that bad. Certainly sometimes periods it's better, sometimes it's not. With the stop of Muslims, there's not as much of a pressure. But on the eastern side, Muslims continue to try to press into what's modern day Turkey, so obviously they won. But, you know, that becomes a real problem for the Byzantine end. So that becomes, you know, I mean, that side, there's a lot of conflict going on. Not as much uh, through the West. As we talk, we'll talk about in the latter part, uh, in the later Middle Ages, uh, relationships at various times could be very good. Uh, for example, the uh, Mayan Caliph, uh, Caliph uh, not the Mayan Caliph, the Abbasid Caliph, uh, Arun al-Rashid. Uh, Aaron Watts, 
uh, had some very good relationships with Charlemagne. Uh, they exchanged technology and learning and all these other kinds of things. Uh, while on the other end, uh, the Byzantines are having quite a bit of conflict. Any questions, comments about the spread of Islam? It's in the second half of the Middle Ages that, of course, we'll get into discussing the Crusades and all of those kinds of things that happen, but it doesn't start until uh, 1095 is really when that starts to take place. All right, let's go ahead and end there. As I mentioned, uh, we'll move into culture and society on Thursday. Don't forget, primary source essays, the next round is due on Friday. Summary is coming up two weeks from today, and the next exam coming two weeks from Thursday.